Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this first annual Farm Transition Appreciation Day, which is about taking important steps forward on the farm transition journey. We're here together for a session called Courageous Conversations. This 40 minute presentation has been pre-recorded to remove any internet or Zoom surprises. And there'll be 15 minutes at the end where we can go live for questions and answers. Please use the chat button, which you'll see at the very bottom of your screen. Um, and you use that to type in questions and you can type them in at any time. You don't have to wait to the end. So if you have a question mid midstream, just please go ahead and click on that chat at the bottom and you can type in your question. Also, um, some people like to re remain um, anonymous. So please feel free to select just sending me a private message. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to our technical folks and we'll get rolling. Hello, my name is Kim Seegers Robinson and I've been working with family businesses for 20 years. I specialize in facilitating family conversations and I'm passionate about helping farm families create more productive communication patterns. Most families I work with transition the farm to the next generation, and others decide to sell part, if not all, of the farm to a third party. In either scenario, it's really important the families aligned on their strategy to maintain overall family harmony. Over the next 40 minutes, we'll explore why family businesses naturally have tension, and we'll look at strategies and how to manage it effectively. At Farm Life, we begin with family first, because the family needs to set their own future direction. We start with individual interviews and ensure everyone's voice and perspective are heard. We report back on where the family is aligned and where there is misalignment. We get clear on the family's goals for the future of the farm. Understand how the family communicates, what systems are in place to run the farm effectively, and what areas of tension or active conflict may exist. The next stage is financial, where the farm numbers are analyzed and a qualified expert understands the current state of the farm and looks into personal financial needs. It also includes looking for the best option from a farm tax perspective. The third stage is transition, which is really outlining the, the details of how ownership and leadership will transfer typically over time. And make sure that the expectations are clear and the plan is transparent to everyone involved. And last is getting to the finish line with estate planning and to make sure agreements are completed and understood, ensuring that if something happens to someone unexpectedly, it doesn't derail the long-term plan. My Farm Life colleagues will be reviewing these last three phases in upcoming webinar. It's interesting to look statistically at why family businesses fail to transfer successfully. We found that our clients may often initially focus on the technical side of the farm transfer, while financial planning, tax strategies, and agreements are, of, are, are all a vital part of a successful farm succession plan, the technical details account for a small percentage of transition failure, 3% according to this study. 60% of the reason is because families aren't communicating effectively and trust breaks down. And that's why family's the first step in defining the plan. This step also involves verifying that heirs and successors are ready to lead and what development they may require and that the family is aligned in regard to the future of the farm, what sets that critical foundation. Family businesses are different than non-family run businesses. Being family gives the farm some great advantages like increased commitment levels and higher willingness to invest in the future and taking a longer term view as some examples. Most farm families we work with make decisions not only for themselves, but also for the success of future generations. And there are overlaps between family and the farm business. This overlap creates an interdependence and increases the odds of conflict. Some families call it tension or frustration. It may be active or bubbling below the surface. Regardless of how it shows up, it's actually very normal. Families are more emotionally driven, where everyone wants to feel equal, to be accepted, belong, and feel loved and where loyalty is rewarded. And here's where we're often our best. And we may also be at our worst because it might be our safe environment. And then we have the farm business. 
And those are for those that are actively working on the farm day to day. And the farm is about growth and cash flow and creating profit and getting stuff done and ensuring we have the leaders in place to drive the farm forward in the future. Membership here is voluntary and decisions tend to be more rational and less emotional from this point of view. And what's valued the most is how people contribute to the farm and what results they create. Owners determine the direction of the farm. They control the future. They know what risks they want to take. They take a look at where they want to reinvest for the future and to create growth and whether profits are retained back into the business or distributed to owners as examples. So the needs of each of these three circles is, are different and there are overlaps with, and these overlap areas create some unclear boundaries. These different and overlapping needs are what create that tension, which is normal. As an example, for a farm business, one family member may want everyone to be paid the same. This person is focused on the needs of the family, everyone treated equal. Another family member may feel family employees should be paid market-based, based on their role and contribution. And this is more of a farm business type perspective. Neither of these perspectives is necessarily right or wrong. However, it will create tension which will lead to active conflict. If we think of each circle as wearing a different hat, so when we're discussing an idea, working through a problem, or looking to make a decision, what hat am I wearing? What perspective am I bringing? And what is the ripple effect now in the long term of my perspective? So these can be some tough waters to navigate in a family business because each system has its own rules and traditions, patterns and expectations. So as a family, it's important to know the perspective of where each person is coming from when you're working through differences. When we work with farm families, we're looking to initially verify the strength of five key areas. As I describe each, consider how you would rank your current situation between one and 10, with 10 being the strongest score. The first area is open communication. When everyone feels safe to share their ideas and we feel heard, we're transparent with each other, we're open about our mistakes, and are willing to listen to different ideas, and we know what is expected of us. In a family business, there are traditional roles like parent, child, or oldest and youngest siblings as examples, and these can create some power dynamics that impact open communication. There may also be alliances between family members and conversations held behind the scenes. This can create a situation where a third party is used to relay a message rather than two people having open and direct discussion themselves. The second area is where our vision and values are aligned. Are we rowing in the same direction or are we wasting time and energy trying to convince each other of a different path? And how often does that happen? Does one family member want to expand through buying more land and another may want to re reinvest in efficient equipment? If we aren't aligned in where we're headed and why, it can make making decisions difficult. Sometimes families struggle when the third generation or cousin ownership level um, starts to rise. In these cases, partnerships were created by birth and may not have been by choice. So it's important that we get on the same page at every generation and create that long-term alignment. The third area is level of trust. Do I feel I can trust people's motives and believe they have my back? Do I feel they will act with integrity and have the courage to do what is right? Do I believe they consistently show up and keep their promises? Would people let us down or act with a higher self-interest rather than taking a bigger perspective on what is best for the farm, it eats away at the level of trust. If there are trust issues, issues it can be rebuilt. It starts by understanding the root cause behind it. Fourth is consensus decision making. How is the farm reaching decisions? Is it clear who is involved and when and why based on the type of decision being made? In some families, there's an autocratic leader who makes the decisions. Others may consult and then make their decision. Some families vote and the majority rules. And this can work if the same people aren't always on the losing end of being voted down on their ideas and perspective. Ideally, we're taking the time to explore different points of view and reaching a consensus. 
This is where those involved help shape the decision. And that doesn't mean that everyone fully agrees, but they might be willing to live with it. I found it's amazing. If we have a process of how to make a decision together, it's just as important as the decision itself. Because if I feel heard and I agree with the process, I may be able to live with the result even if I initially felt differently. So how clear is the decision-making process for your farm? And how effective are we at working through different perspectives and arriving at a decision we can all support? And this decision became, decision making becomes more complicated as more generations are involved in the farm. And last is our ability to resolve conflict. Conflict or tension in a family business, as we've said, is normal and can be quite healthy when it's handled well. A family that can manage conflict doesn't have to, has done the work to create a safe environment for people to raise their ideas and concerns. And they have an agreement on how they want to speak to each other and work through their differences. If the, and if the discussion goes offside, we have a process to bring it back to productive conversation. We also know when we're stuck that we should engage a third party. Families have some work to do if there are undiscussable areas and people don't share their true concerns where issues are avoided and it becomes an underground conversation, which isn't healthy in the long term because it builds resentment, which will bubble later. Other families um, may be able to raise issues with each other, but it creates harmful arguments where a winner and a loser emerge, which will drive a wedge in our relationships, which is obviously also unhealthy. Today, we'll dive deeper into strategies for creating open communication and managing conflict more effectively. When 60% of the reason family businesses struggle to transfer to the next generation is because of communication and trust, it's a key area to pay attention to. In our work, we often find there's an opportunity to improve communication. We recommend each family design how you'll communicate with each other, which will be different for each family. And when you build an agreement together and design what works best for the traditions and beliefs of your family, it can be very powerful. For example, one family may indicate that they don't like swearing and another family might say that doesn't matter to them. And both might want to have conversation in a calm tone. Some families have words or phrases or nonverbal cues that trigger people. And it's important to flush them out and address it before there are any tough conversations. And what if we disagree? How would we like to see opposing thoughts raised? How can we signal to one another that we need a break or we're discuss struggling with the discussion um, and, and, and it's not the best time to cover it? Do we understand our different styles or needs? Sometimes we assume that everyone is like us and they need the same things. However, that's often not the case. Someone might like to talk things out. Someone else in the family might want to go in and think about it and not talk about it until they're ready. So how do you meet both of those people's needs? Behavioral assessment tools are a great way to understand what each family member needs and to start those conversations. This can be a real a helpful exercise for your family. We use a tool called Predictive Index in our work to help family more deeply understand how people communicate solve problems, view risk, and make decisions as examples. Sometimes families sit in silent disagreement or don't raise what they're thinking to keep the peace. Question to ask yourself, is keeping silent with someone when something concerns you, is it healthy in the long run? If people in the room don't know there's a difference of opinion, they can't address the underlying concern and can't find a common ground for resolution. And so that creates a scenario where the issue goes underground. We may unknowingly sabotage each other, and when that sabotage comes, it usually starts with we just stop informing each other and communication suffers. And it can go to extremes like creating silos within the farm business. As an example, we've seen families divide up their land or separate out the development cycle of their animals so they don't have to work together day to day, all to keep the peace. What is best for the farm? What patterns are we creating that will pass on to the next generation? It's something to be really cautious of. Um, one way or another, conflict will bubble out. Silence is rarely golden. 
How can we make sure each family member feels safe in expressing their true thoughts? Families often have sensitive topics they avoid because they believe by ignoring them, we're, per we're preserving the family harmony. Some sensitive topics we've come across is families not wanting to discuss money openly or put off succession planning as, as a taboo or aren't addressing a family member who isn't doing their job well on the farm, just as some examples. And by avoiding them, I'm sure we can all relate that frustration will build up. So can we talk calmly and openly with each other? And what are your family's sensitive topics? It's always best to design a communication agreement before you get stuck before emotions are heightened and relationships start to strain, my best advice to you is don't wait till you have a problem. And if you feel you do have a communication problem, all is not lost. We've seen many families work through their issues and come out stronger. I wanted to share with you an example of a communication agreement to give you an idea of what you can define as a family. Well, this is simplified for today's discussion and will give you an idea of what you could cover. In this family, active listening is really important. And it's important not just to write down the words, but have the discussion and say, what does active listening really mean? Which might be different for each family member. It's important to explore each person's perspective. And if we stop listening, how do we get each other back on track? It's really important because we're human. We're gonna make mistakes. and need to be reminded to get back to productive conversation from time to time. If we've agreed in advance, on how to bring ourselves back. It really takes the edge off. This is an example. Every family needs to start with a blank piece of paper and develop it together with those initial three questions. How do we want to communicate with each other to have open, effective discussions? What is our history in working through differences of opinion? And how do we want to disagree? How do we get past silent disagreement? How can we get each other back on track if we go offside? Then review this agreement and use it at the start of every meeting and every family business meeting to remind ourselves how we wanna to operate together to bring out the best conversation possible. Let's meet the Hunters, a multi-generational farm family in Southwestern Ontario. Names and details have been changed to protect the family. The farm is proudly owned by mom Mary, an 80 year old widow, she inherited the farm in the 70s from her own family, and her family has been raised on the farm. Her husband passed away two years ago. Her son, Bruce, is 55 years old, and he has worked alongside his dad until his death his entire life. Bruce and his wife, Susan, raised their three children on the farm. Firstborn son is named Matthew. He works off the farm as an engineer, and him and his wife, Sarah, have two children. Middle child is an only daughter is named Maggie, she left the farm to go to university, and after school, she received a job off on a dairy farm about 45 minutes away from the home farm. She's been focused on herd management. She's eager to come back to the farm to work. The youngest son is named Mark. He didn't go away to university, and he really felt someone needed to be there to support his dad, and he's been working on the farm for 10 years. So when we started our work, there were some significant and yet common roadblocks and some hesitations that the family was feeling. Let's take a look at that family business model with the three circles as it relates to this Hunter family. So we've got Maggie, Matthew and Sarah and the grandkids in the family circle. Um, however, remember Maggie wants to be in the home farm business. So she probably sees herself in the middle between family and the farm business. And she may tread into that territory with her brother and her, and her parents, which could create some tension. Um, and we're always interested to see how our clients define family. Does it include in-laws, live-ins, and are the next generation voices included? And if not now, when? Everyone who is family is in the family circle by birthright. And many families do include in-laws in their family discussions and others may keep them out. We recommend including everyone who has an influence over the family. That doesn't mean including them necessarily to make decisions or have involvement in the farm business, but shutting down voices and involvement in the family circle will hurt their husband or wife and the next generation. In the business circle, 
we've got Bruce and Susan and Mark and Grace. So one area to note is that Mark and Grace see Grace in this, this overlap because they're both family and in the farm business, so they sit in between them. Um, however, not everyone in the family sees Grace there. Um, Grace does do some work on the farm, but it's more casual. She does some paperwork from time to time and, and some barn work to help out Mark when necessary. And she's definitely more involved in harvest when it's um, when there's busy season. But generally speaking, she's not involved day to day. So it's interesting to see how families um, understand part time and casual work and how it's viewed um, within the family situation. This can, can create tension within farm families for sure. And then last, we've got um, Mary or mom or grandma, who is an owner and family. So she's sitting in the middle. Um, now she doesn't work day to day on the farm the way she used to. She's still doing the lion's share of the book work. Um, so, um, so she's evolving um, to maybe be family and owner and maybe less farm business. But it's also time to look at that far, farm ownership. And um, you know, Bruce and Susan being in their mid fifties, um, the time has come for them to feel like they own something. So based on how all of the members of the Hunter family are connected within these circle, you can see how they might have different perspectives and different needs, and this shapes how they think. When, the, when we met the Hunters, they didn't have active conflict. Upon investigation, we found some bubbling issues. It's important to note that bubbling issues tend to get amplified when we start to talk about making changes and definitely implementing a succession plan is an example of a significant change. Because the main reason farms don't transfer successfully is because of communication and, dress, uh, and trust, not addressing those concerns and focusing primarily on the technical transfer details can really drive a wedge in relationships. Some areas that came out of our discovery with the hunters you know, we know that Maggie wants to return to the home farm, but not everyone is actually aware of that. And she's wondering if she should potentially be paid more because of her education and experience. And what if Mark and Maggie want to do the same jobs on the farm? Is there even room for them on the farm? And these are the type of tensions that can come up that need to be addressed. Mark has contributed to the farm for ten last 10 years, where his brother and sister have not. He gave up going to school, which he sees as was a sacrifice and has been a significant part of the growth of the farm, not just the fact that land values have gone up, but also the farm overall has, has grown. And so we call that sweat equity. And so how will that be accounted for as we talk through the transition plan? And then Matthew just wants to make sure that his kids um, are considered. Um, they, he wants them to have the opportunity to be to be join the farm if they want to and because him and his wife aren't on the farm does that mean they'll be excluded into future plans and non-farming children may want to be in, included or have a show uh, sorry a share of growth of the farm they may not want to wait till mom and dad are gone to get their share another common area of concern is what if mom is worried about protecting the farm up against marriage breakdown before she gives up ownership so these are the type of things that we need to work through with the family before the technical details are confirmed. And while there's not active conflict right now in the Hunter family, all of these areas could create serious family issues and impact their family relationships, which is the opposite of what that family wants to achieve. So the question is, is how do you go through these areas, address the bubbling concern? Let's take a deeper look at how to handle conflict. Regardless if conflict is active or bubbling, it's triggered when we feel excluded, marginalized, disrespected, or ignored, and we feel our needs aren't being met. So we're always interested as farm advisors in exploring the root causes of the conflict, frustrations, or tension. And really the source of issues come um, from these three areas. The first being systematic, and that's basically what the systems and processes and influences are in place. It's not about people, it's about structures and how is the farm run and how do we make decisions? How do we communicate? Does it allow for open dialogue or people feel excluded? Are roles and expectations clear? Are boundaries between family and business um, well-documented? Sorry. So these issues are not related to a person. 
I love saying, show me a system and I'll show you your future. It's important our systems keep shifting as the farm evolves. How decisions are made at generation one will be different how, on how decisions are made um, as siblings at generation three as an example. So it, interpersonal is how we relate to each other. It's, it's the state of our relationship dynamics and those roles we talked about, um, parent, child, sibling roles. And what are some of the historical issues that may be sitting between people? I often like to think that if someone, if we feel someone is being unreasonable, it's important to explore what lies beneath. Usually there's a reasonable explanation for unreasonable behavior. And the person might need some clarity to understand and be able to express it effectively. And on the personal level, this is what's going on as an individual, as me as a person. What development do I need to be my best? What needs am I not, do I have that aren't being met and they're not related to other people? So in the Hunter family, there are systematic issues. They don't have a forum to have discussions as a family. Some people feel included, others excluded. They don't have a process in place to communicate effectively. They have a history of silent disagreement. And there is no family employment policy. So how people get paid and what roles they have. And you can imagine that'll become more important if Maggie returns. And there is no decision-making protocols. Uh, decisions tend to be ad hoc in the moment and who based on who's around and so some people feel left out so on the personal interpersonal level the relationships are strong and the family gets along but because of that silent disagreement there is a pattern to ignore problems and that could create issues that need to be addressed maggie and mark have competing interests um, that you know need we need to take a look at on the personal level, Maggie, just as an example, avoids confrontation. And she's not been open to expressing her desire to return to the farm. So it's her natural tendency to avoid. So how can we help her find her voice and for her to feel safe in, in raising her needs? So this gives us a map across these three areas, how to explore these concerns that are bubbling in the Hunter family. We would begin by designing a, a system for open dialogue. So that communication agreement we reviewed before is the starting point before we tackle anything else. If you'd like to continue to follow along with the Hunter family, there are three other webinars. The next one is named Clarity on Cash Flow, um, Fueling Your Farm Transition and Transition Livelihood. When we're working with a family, we're looking to confirm their natural patterns and history and responses to conflict. Our goal is to create constructive conflict and facilitate open conversation without injuring relationships. Conflict can be active and constructive, where I'm comfortable sharing my ideas and how I feel, where I'm actively listening and looking to understand other people's perspectives, putting myself in their shoes. With an open mind, I'm being creative and looking to find common ground. We all know conflict can be destructive, and that tends to be what we think of when we think of conflict. When it's active, people may go to who's right and wrong, may lash out in anger, become defensive or blame. And sarcasm or other ways to devalue people may show up, like eye rolling and people saying whatever. Retaliation can be done in front of people or it might be passive aggressive behind the scene. So from a passive point of view, construct, uh, conflict can also be destructive. Giving in to someone else um, may be how it starts. And often people start by not sharing their emotions and avoiding issues as, and they become more destructive behaviors when emotions can no longer be retained. So people can cycle between avoiding um, passive destructive and active destructive when we um, get upset and, and, and go to fight mode. Or maybe people might just refuse to talk about things, which is also destructive. And so these are the, on the destructive side, these are the classic fight, flight, or freeze tendencies that we have as humans. Passive conflict isn't necessarily um, bad. Passive conflict actually can be quite constructive. So passive conflict that's constructive looks like, you know what, I need a temporary timeout here or a temporary delay. I might need to think about something I've heard or weigh pros and cons or just settle my emotions and discuss it when I feel more rational. It's not the same as avoiding because it means it's temporary. I have intentions of coming back to discuss. Or you might just let it go altogether. So this is different than giving in. Giving in is when I 
feel I'm losing or I'm giving something up or I'm emotionally attached to what's going on. Letting go is choosing to accept the situation and feeling neutral about it, um, adapting and not harboring over time. So in 2016, Ernst & Young had a survey and um, nearly half that responded to that survey reported in family business that there was dysfunctional conflict, 50%. So it's critical to determine um, what our com communication patterns are and move back to constructive methods. What's interesting here is this model indicates that conflict are behaviors that we learn and can therefore be altered if we're, we manage and aware of it. So we're working with families, we wanna understand what are the patterns, um, how do individuals tend to respond, and how can we move to the constructive side of the equation here? Human beings are complex. We have a higher level brain that's rational and a great creative problem solver. And we have a lower brain that's more reptilian in nature. And when that lower brain is triggered, we definitely aren't at our best. Some people, when triggered, attack. Others go in defensive mode. And others may just run away from the situation. Uh, none of these are examples of effective and open communication. We all have stress in our life. And it's natural that we're going to be triggered into this lower brain. The question is, how can we design it? within ourselves and within our family business to move from the storm back to the calm, which means if I feel triggered, I'm about to react, or I might not be listening as well as I want, or I might feel too emotional for the situation that's in front of me. That's when I know I'm in the storm. So how do I handle that? So what's the, what's the pathway back? The best pathway um, is to take a pause with statements like, sorry, I'm not ready to discuss that right now. Could we set aside time to discuss later? And remember, later doesn't mean never, because if it's not a way to avoid it. It's giving some time to get back to that calmer, higher brain to have the conversation. Or I'm in the middle of something and it won't give me the focus it, this deserves right now. Can, when can we discuss this at a later point? Or I'm feeling tired or stressed or distracted or maybe I'm anxious or upset. Whatever it is, is being honest about how I feel right now. And I don't want to bring that into our discussion. Can we set aside some time to discuss it later? I'll be in a much better position to collaborate about this tomorrow morning. Does that work for you as examples? So it's human to bounce between calm and storm. Some people's storm is obvious because it's in our face. And other people's storm is quiet and going on internally. Either way, the person knows that they're in storm. And so can you catch that before we react? Take a pause, have some statements that we use with each other. Sometimes some families we work with um, have symbols or things they hold up or a, a word they say that said, so they don't have to have a, a, a long conversation about it, but the other person knows that means they need a pause to come back to calm. That's a great thing you can build in your communication agreement. When one moves to storm, what can they say that will help everyone that's in the room understand they need a moment to move back to calm? So you might want to engage a third party. Um, there's a lot at stake in a family business. And even if you want to change, it isn't easy because you're in patterns that you're used to. Even if you don't like the patterns, they're patterns that we are skilled at running together. And when you're, whether you're feeling there's silent disagreement, you're worried about bubbling issues or your family is in active destructive conflict, these are all patterns you've created together. So to change a pattern, it requires us to get uncomfortable even if we want to do it, do it. And because while we're suffering by the bad pattern, we actually hold on to what we know. So be prepared um, that it will take some work and we might fall off the wagon, revert back to old patterns, even if we've chosen to move forward. That's why a third party can be helpful because they aren't in the problem. They're not in the family. They're not in those three circles. And it can help you see the bigger perspective, um, help you create some structure and accountability and help people shift. So these are some reasons why a third party might help um, if you're interested. So wanted to thank you 
um, for taking the time to join us. For those that are in Ontario, we have a, um, a relationship with the OFA um, to provide succession planning. And um, that means 10% reduction on fees, um, complimentary initial consultation. You will get access to workshops that we create with the OFA um, and we're proud to offer follow-ups. So we're gonna move over to questions and I really wanna thank you for participating with us today. Thank you everyone um, for taking the time to join us. We're um, now going into the um, live Q&A and I know we have some questions in there. Um, so one of the questions um, that was sent to me privately is with the Hunter family, how did you help the family move past difficult conversations? Um, th that is a tricky one because they have a pattern of um, silent disagreement. So we started with that communication agreement um, and we didn't go in there uh, with a sample. We didn't go in there with preconceived notions of how people should behave. We went around the table, a round table, and heard everyone's voices to say, you know, where have we had good communication? Where have we struggled? Uh, how can we create a safe environment? Um, we talked about what the undiscussables were as a family and what they were worried about and what the motives were behind those undiscussables. Um, and we talked about how to shift to a new pattern. For Maggie, it was individual coaching to help her find her voice and be comfortable. And then when after we did discovery um, with each individual, which is pretty extensive, and, um, and so everybody feels like they've been heard and they know we're gonna protect what they've said as we roll it up into themes um, that's not attributable to any individual. And we shared those results where they were aligned and where they were misaligned and that created so much great dialogue. So another question we have in here was, uh, from Heather about a communication agreement. Do you find farm families are embracing this tool? Um, yes, um, I, I've found they have. Um, obviously, I haven't been involved with situations where farm families have created them themselves. The ones that I've helped them create, um, because we have gone through discovery first, so we have a trusted relationship with each other, and, and then we can have an open dialogue together and talk about what good communication looks like. Um, when people build it themselves, I've found they're much more likely to want to honor it um, because their voice was heard. They were part of the process and part of crafting it. The other great thing about a communication agreement is that, as I mentioned, we're, we're, not, we're not perfect. We're human beings. We can be messy, um, which also makes us lovely. <laughs> and um, so when, when we get messy, how do we interrupt that? And because we've talked about it in advance to say, listen, we know it can be messy when we go offside, how do we want to bring each other back? So if I've been part of designing how to bring us back to a good spot, then I don't feel as triggered as a human because I was part of that agreement. So it's just, it's important to be part of that process um, as, much as, uh, as much as it is the, the words themselves. And then um, have some discipline to use them. And so when we're working with families, we use it at the beginning of every meeting and we go through it and we talk about is, is it still relevant and, and maybe something cropped up at the last meeting that we need to go back and update it on because maybe that wasn't something we talked about. For example, maybe we hadn't covered confidentiality and maybe someone in the room was concerned that, that what they said would be taken out um, into the remain, remainder of the family or potentially into the community. And they don't, and they feel really sensitive about that. So then we can have a great conversation about confidentiality. So it's something you can build. Um, okay, there's another question in here is, um, how can you get communication started when the older generation has a major blow up every time? My husband and I have talked about bringing someone in to help, but we know that even bringing that up with his parents will create some major problems. That's, that's a great question. It is harder for um, the younger generation to bring in um, um, a third party uh, because um, it could be it, it's often the older generation is the one that is holding the purse strings and definitely holding the power dynamic um, that being said 
um, it's, it's, it's not uncommon. It's actually um, pretty normal that the older generation may have some reservation because there's probably some undiscussables in there. So undiscussables could be talking about transitioning the farm. Uh, an undiscussable is talking about how to shift power or money or many different things. And so my advice there is um, give them back their power and, um, and, and on, on the topic and, and then have them reach out. And the question is, will they? Well, talk about why it's so important to you and talk, about, talk from your heart about what you want to see happen and also talk about what you don't want to see happen. So if you know what the sensitive areas are, you know, address them with each other. So I would have a private, quiet conversation that's, uh, that's heartfelt and ask if, say, if they'd be willing to just do an introduction call. And then on the introduction call, it's the person you're working with um, could be a member uh, like myself of Farm Life, and there's other resources across the country that provide great services as well. Um, it's their job to disarm, to normalize the situation, and make sure that the older generation feels comfortable and build that trust. Um, the next one is, um, what's your best advice for people who struggle to communicate? What sort of opportunities are to improve communication skills, the learning and opportunities or training programs you recommend? That, that's, um, that's a great question. Communication patterns are usually uh, very ingrained and have been passed down through the generations. And so we, families tend to have a history that, that goes with them. And so they might, many of them might have a blind spot. So a big part of working with a third party would be education. And so um, oftentimes when we have family meetings, one of the items on the agenda is education. And that can be across generation. One of my favorite things to do is to work with uh, the upcoming generation, those in their um, late teens, early 20s, um, to late 20s, and, and, and have family meetings just with them and educate them about the future and how they want to be. And it's amazing the ideas and energy that comes out of that generation. And But so many farm families say, I don't know what happened to Jimmy, but after that meeting, he's, he's, coming, he's coming into the barn early. I don't know what's going on. It's because their voice wasn't heard. In terms of um, other areas to build communication skills, um, maybe I could take that off, offline with you because there's, there's many, but you'll, you'll find communication programs at local, local colleges, you'll see them at universities. Um, there's some great ones that, um, that I just can't think of off the top of my head, I apologize, but there's some great ones that can get it started. But because it's ingrained and it's part of the family's history, it's not just knowing the skills, it's knowing how to shift them. Um, so awareness is definitely number one. Um, and then the tricky part is how do we shift that as, as a family unit? Um, another question that's come up um, is how would you recommend we start when there's active hurtful conflict, conflict that is driven primarily by one family member? And, and I'm really glad that you said primarily by one family member versus a family member. Um, primary versus solely are different because even though one might be perceived as being the aggressor, it takes two to tango. Um, and so it's the first thing you need to do is get to the root. So you think back to the hunters, um, there's systematic conflict, there's relational conflict, there's personal conflict. The first thing I'm, I'm interested in as, as a third party resource <clears throat> is what's driving it. What's driving it? And so it could be the protocols and the processes that you're using or not using on the farm are what's actually causing it. So as an example, it could be um, family members that feel excluded or their voice isn't heard. And, and maybe, maybe in some cases their voice shouldn't be heard because maybe they're not actively involved in the farm business. In other cases, they should be included. And so first figuring out um, for different topics and decision making, it's a conversation who should be involved. And if people are part of that, even if they originally felt excluded, they understand why they're being excluded because it might not be an area they need to be involved with, but these are other areas we really want them involved, involved with. It can make a big difference. Um, and um, so it's getting to the root of it, understanding the historical patterns and at a practical level, starting to build trust um, and commitment. And I, like, I love starting with that communication agreement because it's really starting from scratch. Um, another question is, do you find that personality testing is helpful to help people understand how, how they and other people are wired, um, what they could work on? Um, yeah, I find it's very, very interesting. 
So sometimes families say, we don't need to take this behavioral personality type testing because we, like, we, we know each other, we've lived together, we've grown up together. Uh, but it's amazing how we may not understand the nuances of why someone is the way they are. And so um, <clears throat> someone might be naturally dominant. Another person might be um, significantly less dominant. But that doesn't mean either is smarter or uh, more involved or either has better ideas. It's just one person's voice might be coming to the service more. And if that person understands that their sibling or cousin or parent is naturally less dominant, even though they, they know that instinctively, it's not new information, they can, we can surface it and we can talk about how to handle that. Well, you know, it's really important to make sure they're actually on board because they aren't quick to, um, to voice concern. We might need to give them an agenda beforehand of what we want to talk about so they can think about it and get comfortable. We need to make sure there's a safe space for them to talk. And we need to make sure that they're, they actually agree. Because sometimes when people are more dominant, they, they blow over people that aren't. But that doesn't mean, so that's where silent disagreement can kick in there. So it's when we understand each other and we can normalize why people are different, it's amazing the conversation that can happen and the impact that can have on the communication agreement. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Heather. That's a great comment. Uh, so I think there's some questions in the Q&A too. Um, someone is asking, Trudy's asking, can we access the other three webinars you spoke of? Um, maybe at the end, I'll ask people um, to um, ask the, the, the folks from FMC that are on here helping me with the technical details to comment on that. I know they were, are also being recorded, so will be on that website. Um, Brian is asking, how would you initiate the idea of creating a family communication agreement if you're the rising generation? Great question, Brian. Um, you know, it's, again, it, it's about creating safety and respect. Conflict is triggered when people feel disrespected or their needs aren't being met. So if we're um, a younger generation and we want to raise that with the older generation, we need to do it very carefully and respectfully, depending on the environment. Like if, if you have a very good relationship and open dialogue and you can debate things, that you, that's, that's easier. But if you have a history of silent disagreement or um, destructive conflict, that's a little trickier. So I would initiate it by indicating that you want to have stronger communication. You might want to show them that, that um, chart on um, what breaks down communication, breaks down transition, which communication is, is you know, a big percentage of that. And then talk about how, they can, how you can work on it together. How can you work together to create open dialogue? And ask some of those questions. Say, I, I want to be um, more involved. I want to be able to help you out. Um, I want us to have better communication. What ideas do you have? I find if you go to people with questions, you start with questions rather than making statements. If you make statements like, you don't, my voice isn't being heard, and so we need a communication agreement, that's gonna trigger somebody. And so think about how, what questions can I ask um, that will get dialogue started. The next question is, <clears throat> how do you deal with an autocratic situation, the attitude that the communication agreement isn't something they think they need? Well, we have to get back behind what, what's driving the autocratic. Um, if someone is being autocratic in terms of decision making um, and they're not listening to other voices, first we need to get curious as to what's behind it. Um, and you know that there can be many things that cause that. Um, and some of them are things that can be solved by communication agreement and sometimes there's something deeper that might require um, some sort of um, some therapy. And, um, and so it, it depends on what's going on there. Sometimes that person that's autocratic just needs to be heard and, and listened to and feel like they're important and needed and wanted um, and they're willing to start to release pieces of it. And remember, it doesn't have to be all or, or nothing just to say, is there something that you're comfortable that we can be involved in making decisions and where are you not comfortable with us making decisions and what is the decision making protocol? So um, there's many different ways to handle that. I, I apologize, it's hard to describe uh, that. That's a complex situation. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, where and how do I get involved with the process I work with in wealth management and our starting point is typically financial. Um, where the family's not discussed family. Uh, where do you get involved and do I just get involved in the family component? Um, the answer to that is, is, is yes. If there's a trusted relationship 
with a financial advisor, an accountant, or a lawyer. Uh, we always respect that, and we work as a team. Um, so in those cases uh, where there is a team in place already and the family part needs to be covered, that's where we come in, work on the family part, share the results with other professionals, and then the other professionals would pick up the other pieces. But there might be pieces along the way that the family doesn't have a trusted advisor that we can recommend people work with, um, with somebody that we've worked with in the past. We're very open to what that looks like. Um, let's see. Um, tell us more about the assessment you use. Does it focus on personality individual in, or in individual ways of handling conflict? <clears throat> um, the, the assessment, I assume you're meaning the predictive index is the one that we use. The predictive index um, is, we really love it because it's other personality assessment tools take an hour or two hours to take. And this one takes 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and it's ridiculously accurate. I, I mean, um, I mean, I don't, I'm not here to sell predictive index. It's just, we really love it um, because most people don't want to spend an hour taking those things. And um, so it, it focuses on the individual first, and then we use it to map what the family looks like on a grid to say, okay, this is this, so say, let's take dominance as an example. So we map everybody on a grid as to where they are in dominance and we have a conversation about that. The other thing is it, it maps people out in terms of conflict styles and decision-making styles and risk profiles. It does all this great mapping so that can drive these amazing conversations. Um, but a lot of conflict has to do with um, also understanding the values of the family and what they deeply believe in and the history of conflict. And those are the type of things that um, we also incorporate around the assessment tool. And so some people don't want to invest in the assessment. And so then we would just go to um, just interviews to understand people's style and history and et cetera. It depends on the family. Next is how can I go about getting my parents to open up about financials when the question is always, that doesn't concern you right now, but as an owner, now I feel like it is. Yeah, transparency is, is a lot about trust. And so the first thing is to understand um, what's behind that. So if, if I was getting a response um, from my parents that said, that doesn't concern you right now, my question would be, would, would be to first um, acknowledge that you know, that's their point of view. So first, so how I handle, this is really an objection, how I like to see people handle objections and how, um, and how we, um, we cover that. Is, is, is a process. The first is when someone's giving you an opposing view, you first need to acknowledge them. So if you don't acknowledge them, they don't feel acknowledged in their point of view, they won't, they won't be open to listening to yours. So if someone said that to me, I would say, um, I understand that you don't believe that, that that's my, important to me right now. And I just like to, to understand more about why you feel that way or what's behind that. So I would continue to ask questions. I would think, what questions can I ask that will get me more information and we'll start dialogue. Um, I think we're running out of time. Um, there's one more I'll cover here and then we'll wrap up. Um, I'm an equal shareholder in our farm um, and the accountant. I have been accused of accounting wrongdoing, but I don't know what I did wrong. What I've been trying out exactly the complaint, but I've had no success. Because of this, I am no longer included in discussions or meetings. Where can I go for help? Well, we need to get to the root from that. So if, if someone feels like that you've done some wrongdoing, um, I would ask for some, I would ask some questions. I would get curious as to what's behind that. Um, understand their point of view and, and, and be careful not to get defensive to listen. So use that same thing, acknowledge their point of view and, and insert yours or insert a question. That's how I would handle it. So I know we have to wrap up now. I apologize if I've missed some questions. Um, you can definitely get more information on the farm management website. Uh, I think I've listed it in, in it before. It's farmtransitionguide.ca. This, this recording as well as others from today will be on there. I know they have other resources as well. Um, you can also um, check us out on our, our website, uh, which you can find by um, looking for um, Farm Life Financial, and we have some resources there and our contact if you're looking for support or some more information. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. I know they wanna leave some time for you to get into other sessions because um, there's another one starting at 10. Um, take care, um, stay safe, and uh, appreciate your time.